Abraham Lincoln once said, no one is poor who has a godly mother. And I believe he was right. The influence of a godly mother on her children cannot be overstated. One writer said, no nation is ever greater than its mothers for they are the makers of men. Dr. Basil Jackson, a psychiatrist, he said, a child will never come to full psychological development and maturation in adulthood unless the child has had a mother in the home. Isn't it true that God has blessed us all with wonderful mothers and we have beautiful memories of mothers? Somebody said that, child is carried by the mother in the womb for nine months, but a child is carried in the mother's heart for a lifetime. And these are mothers. Mothers have a very good place in the society, very high priority, and the Bible exalts motherhood. Sarah, Rachel, Jochebed, Deborah, Ruth, Elizabeth, Mary, Motherhood is a wonderful thing and exalted by the Holy Bible. Open your Bibles with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I want to share with you about a mother, a mother named Hannah. She presents to us the pattern of a godly mother. When we think about the historical background about the book of 1 Samuel, it's, it's a time between the judges and the kings. The judges, the last judge Samson had been wicked and he just got killed. And the land needs a good leader to lead the children of Israel in the promised land. And they had archangels called as the Philistines. And by the time of Hannah, the Philistines were taking control over the land. And they were having an upper hand. God needed a leader because even the priests in the place of worship, in the tent of the meeting, the priests were wicked. And they were doing ugly things and blasphemous things in the temple. So God needed a leader. And in order to birth a leader, God was looking for a mother, a godly mother. And that's where Hannah comes into picture. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, and this verse 1 to 2, there was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham and the son of Elihu the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraimite, he had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Here we meet a strange family. One man with two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children and Hannah had no children and Elkanah was a husband. The first question somebody can ask us is whether polygamy is okay in the Bible. Polygamy is not okay. It's not advocated in the Bible at all. And God has instituted for one man, one wife. And again reiterated in the New Testament. So one woman, one husband. Polygamy is not permitted in the Bible. But... In this situation that what we are reading now and in the ancient uh, Bible literature and their culture, it was allowed not according to the Bible but according to the culture that if a husband and wife is married and the man is not able to conceive through his wife, uh, for them taking care of the family property and lineage and heritage, having a heir in their line is very important and this kind of society allowed them to take a wife. Other than the wife who is not able to have a child so that he can have his lineage continue. So that was a society then. And remember, the scripture had not been fully revealed and given to them. And God has allowed it to happen even though it was not God's will uh, for the people of God. So uh, polygamy is not advocated by the Bible. By the way, what Elkanah did is not a good thing for all of us to uh, see because there are other husbands in the Bible, in the, especially in the Old Testament times, where their wives could not conceive, especially, who is that? Isaac. Isaac's wife could not conceive and Rebekah uh, was barren and what did Isaac do? 
Isaac took that matter to the Lord because he realized that having a second wife is not an option if God can open the womb. He is a creator God. And he took his wife's matter as a husband to God. And, and the Bible says in Genesis chapter 25 verse 21 that the Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. So Elkanah took a wrong option, an option that comes naturally to us. And many times we are like that. We have a choice of waiting on God and depending on God for all our promises to be fulfilled. And we also have on the parallel a natural way to get our prayers answered. I'm not only really talking about children. I'm talking in every aspect of our lives. On one side, we have the faith to wait on the Lord like Isaac. But on the other side, as per the culture, Elkanah could not wait on the Lord and he, couldn't, he did not pray about his wife, even though he was a man of prayer. And he did things in the natural what other people would do. How are we this morning? Are we like an Elkanah? We are coming to God to worship. We are God's people. He used to go yearly to worship God at Silo to worship God. He was a God-fearing man. But when it came to matters that concerned him, he, instead of trusting in God, he took things in his hands and he worked and he behaved in the natural way. Well, my subject is not Elkanah. Let's come and concentrate on Hannah this morning. And in Hannah, we can find the demonstration of a godly mother. Three aspects of a godly mother we are just going to look at from the life of Hannah. By the way, this is not only for the wives or the mothers. This is a very good message for family, a very good message for husbands. First of all, Hannah had a right relationship to her husband. In order to be a godly mother, she had to work on having a good relationship, a right relationship with her husband. Husband, And what was the relationship that she shared with her husband? It started with a mutual act of worship to the Almighty God. The relationship she shared with her husband resulted in giving God the number one priority by going with her husband in worship at, at the place of worship called Silo in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and it's verse 3. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrificed to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were the priests of the Lord. So Hannah had a believing and a worshipping husband. And it was a pattern on yearly festivals, according to Deuteronomy and Exodus. A man is supposed to go to the presence of God at least three times yearly during the festivals. And three times we can understand Elkanah being a godly man, he went to the presence of God. He went to the Ark of the Covenant and he worshipped the Lord and he did not go alone. He went with his wife. And when the husband went, the wife was not left behind. She also accompanied her husband to worship uh, God. I believe one of the greatest things that can make a godly mother is also a godly husband. If the husband is godly, if the husband is worshipping, that is one of the first things that is needed to have godly mothers. Let me ask you, dear husbands and wives, are you a worshipping family? Are you a praying family? Are you worshipping the Lord together? You have come to City Harvest this morning. Let me ask you a question. Have you come here alone or left your spouse behind? Or one spouse is worshipping online and one is in-house? This is not a good example of a godly family. Maybe for certain reasons, maybe sicknesses or some family challenges you are going through. You can do that, but not on a regular pattern that you worship God alone. Yes, it's important for us to worship God alone, but it's equally important for husband and wife to spend time in worship. Today, the place of worship is not in a local place. Even in our homes when we pray and when we worship God, there should be this unity of husband and wife coming together, sharing their relationship primarily by worshiping the creator who has instituted and brought you together as a family. And Hannah was shared with her husband in worshiping God. Amen? And uh, it was a divided house. 
it was an imperfect house there was a lot of issues that was happening in that house and dysfunctional family because there was a lot of accusation that was happening and this man had two wives and those children you can imagine the problems in that house and what kept that family going in those difficult times it was a worship together to the lord yahweh god dear friends in these times we may go through challenges in our life we may go through situations that is beyond our comprehension to address and figure out what to do but what keeps us together and what lets us navigate through those situations is a worship the altar that husband and wife has together worshiping the almighty god so she shared with her husband in worship regarding her relationship and secondly she also shared with her husband love hannah and elkana they loved one another deeply i can say they loved one another deeply this tells us that marriage is not just spiritual marriage is also emotional psychological and physical intimacy and not only did they share in their worship but they shared affection and they shared love in first samuel chapter 1 verse 4 to 5 when the day came for the elkana to sacrifice he would give portions of the meat to his wife penina and to all her sons and daughters but to hana he gave a double portion because he loved her and the lord had closed her womb look at that word very clearly husband note this word elkana loved his wife and in order to have a godly family a godly father and a godly mother we need to love bring god's love into our husband wife relationships if there is conflict deal it with love now we have many very silly reasons to stay separate and go and sleep in separate rooms and not have any relationship with our spouse but if you are a godly person you need to share in love mutual sacrificial love towards the spouse that god has given to us and elkana look at that he gave her his wife hana a double portion not that he did not love penana he gave what is due to her and her children but look at he knew that hana is suffering she is going through pain he could understand the feelings of his wife he could understand the tears of his wife and that's a great husband over there and it's it's vice versa you can also apply it to you your wives you need to know the struggles and the pain your husband is going through and husbands you need to understand the struggles the weaknesses the mockery and and the backbiting that happens especially you know they lived in a joint family most of us are living in nuclear families but we know that uh, things are not very easy when we get back to our extended families for functions and for marriages and then extended family comes over then in-laws comes over and co-sisters and brothers comes over there will be some talks where our spouse can get affected and and pained and a good loving spouse husband or wife in that case will understand what's happening and how will you cover up because you cannot stop the dirt of the people's mouth they will always keep coming and taunting you in relationships it may be your husband they were taunting or your side of family is coming and taunting your husband or your wife but it takes an understanding spouse to know that your wife is going through ridicule or a husband is going through pain and insult stands by your spouse and express your love and standing by that spouse no matter what that will help us navigate through difficult situations in our life and he gave her a double portion this is something that is given to respected people it is usually a gesture uh, of the ease to honor a guest a preferred guest and he told her that no matter what happens to you or i know that she is mocking you i i'm helpless about it but i want to tell you that i love you unconditionally and can you imagine when you have a dysfunctional family like that what keeps you going forward there are all reasons to separate there is all reasons for hana to say enough is enough i don't want to stay in this house because you have not produced me children and 
Penina is always accusing me. Her children are looking at me in a wrong way. And I'm a cursed woman according to the Old Testament. The Old Testament people looked at barren women as cursed. Enough is enough. I'm fed up of family. I'm just walking out of this place. No. She had an understanding husband. And if you have worship to God, and if you are loving one another as a husband and wife, you can navigate through any and every difficult situations that life brings across in our lives. So here we find a beautiful family. They're shared in relationship to one another by worshiping together and they also shared in loving together. In chapter 1 verse 6 and 7, because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. It is not a one-time affair. She's living with this ridicule. She's living with this pain. She's living with this insult, continuous insult. And what kept her going through these days? To know that there is a husband who loves me unconditionally, no matter what. Dear friends, living in family sometimes can be very stressful. And what keeps that husband and wife relationship going forward is that unconditional love offered by wife to the husband and the husband to the wife. It can take us through every storms of life in the present day situation. And uh, this went on year after year, verse 7. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. And look at the love expressed by the husband over here. She would not eat. Her face was downcast. And he knew Hannah very well. The very gesture of her face. The very body language of his spouse. Even though he had two, we only have one. Right? He had two. He knew both his wives very well. And he went and said to her, in verse 8, her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? So considerate. Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? This man was opening his heart and showing his heart to his wife and telling, don't worry, I'm there for you. I mean for you more than ten sons and I love you and I show it with my expression that I love you. Men, have you taken time to express your love to your wife? She is waiting for that expression. For you, it may, may not be that expression of love by vocalizing and by gifting us certain things. But here we can find this man. He had no counseling, premarital counseling, that this is how you need to manage your marriage. He was a smart man. He knew what his wife needed. He knew that she needed words of affirmation. He knew that she needed some gifts on a timely gifts and he made it a point that there are times that his wife can get irritated, but he would make sure that he would do his part to show his love and unconditionally show it by actions, not only with love, but he showed it with actions and care and concern for her. So they shared beautiful things. Uh, what is it? They shared in worship and they shared love with one another. I don't care what conflict you are having this morning or what circumstances are around you, but if you share in worship and if you share love, there is nothing we cannot overcome by the grace of God. Amen? Today, people get out of marriage for every silly reason. If our family altar is intact, we can solve a lot of issues. Many times when I counsel couples, we, one of the questions we ask them is, do you pray together? They say, no, pastor. How can we pray together? We are fighting all the time. No, first you need to repair your family altar and you see how automatically things will be fine. So they've shared in relationship, worshiping God together and loving one another uh, unconditionally. And the second thing we find about Hannah, she had a right First is husband relationship. Secondly, H, right heavenly relationship. She shared a right heavenly relationship with the everlasting God. When she had a problem, she did not lash out on her husband. Listen to this. When he had a problem, he did not lash out on his 
wife. Whenever we are stressed at work or stressed with relatives, whom do we take out all our stress on? The way we wash our plates and we arrange our home, everything is evident to everybody. Mummy is not in good mood. That was not Hannah. She did not lash out on her husband or her children or take the plates and throw it in such a way and cook the food and tell, come and eat and go. You man, you are not good for anything. Come eat and go. I will cook and give it to you. Did she say that? She was never rude. She knew a place where she could go to with all her problems. But she was long suffering in the relationship that she was in. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 9, once they had finished eating and drinking at Silo, Hannah stood up and now Eli the priest was sitting in his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. Hannah came to see the high priest. By now he is a little old and he can hardly probably sit from his chair because even when the news of war in chapter 4 is coming about the Philistines attacking and killing his sons, where is Eli? He is sitting right in the chair, right in the presence of God, right? He has become so old and he has lost his eyesight. He has lost even his spiritual eyesight probably. And he's sitting over there and Hannah goes in chapter 1 verse 10. In a deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord weeping bitterly. She was bitter in her heart. But where did she go and take out her bitterness and deal with her bitterness? Not in front of her husband. Not in front of her children. Not in front of her adversary. But she went and ran to the presence of God. She was a woman of prayer. Dear mothers, you have a very vital role in prayer. I remember growing up, I have a mother. She's worshipping the Malayalam service there. And I could see her praying in the watches of night. For that matter, even my dad. They would pray and pray, pray for the nation, pray for the children. And growing up, I could see the prayer of my parents. And even today, when I sometimes go into the house, I can see my wife kneeling down and praying for our family, praying for our children. We need prayerful parents. We need people who can pray and spend time giving all your bitterness, the issues of life, your pain in the presence of God. And God is there to answer and hear our prayer. We can find that Hannah was a woman of prayer. In verse 12, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. He watched her and she was just not praying silently her mouth was moving all the time she was praying and she was impassioned in prayer. That was the only way and only place she could express herself. She could not open her mouth in the house. She had no say. Maybe her husband understood her but not to the level that God would understand her. And the only place where she find that relief is in the presence of God and she poured out her heart in the presence of God. She was a woman of prayer. Why did she pray to God? She prayed to God because she knew that Elkanah, her husband was not the source for children. She knew that God is the source of children and God can open her womb if she prays to God and she prayed that God will hear her prayer. D.L. Moody talked about in his message about a man who went to his mother and he said at a young age that I want to enroll myself for military and I want to go and fight the Mexican war. So his mother was a believer and the mother said, uh, son, don't go now. Before you go for war, at least receive Christ as your Lord and only then I'm happy to send you because we do not know what's going to happen in the war. The son said, mom, forget Christ. I will come back from the war and I will receive Christ and I will come with you to church. This mother had a small Bible with all the promises that she had prayed for the son marked out very clearly, highlighted in that Bible. And she took from her purse a small watch, a pocket watch, and she gave it to the son and said, son, read this Bible at least in the war and look at this clock. 
every time the clock strikes 12 in the afternoon remember your mom will be praying for you this man just took everything and put it in his suitcase but to know the time he would keep that watch in his pocket and one day as he was pursuing his duty suddenly he took the clock to see the time and it was just 12 o'clock and suddenly he remembered after four years of living his mom he remembered that my mom is praying right now for me back in my house that really touched him he was moved after four years of mom statement that she will be praying for him and that evening he went back to his room he took the bible because the mom had told that to him and he started reading from the bible and he gave his life to the lord that day mother's prayers are very effective maybe today you are dealing with a child who is not in faith maybe you are dealing with a child who is battling depression and you cannot see your child struggle like this i want to tell you there is help in the presence of god you come to your knees and present your request in the presence of god and our god is a prayer answering god and the lord of hannah is our god he will arise on our behalf when we kneel in the presence of god can i hear an amen church amen she was a woman of prayer not only that she had the passion to give the best to god she had the passion to give the best to god in verse 11 she made a vow of saying lord almighty if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son then i will give him to the lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head so what do we find over here she had a passion for prayer and that passion was to present her best to the lord there was a presentation she was a passionate woman she was a prayerful woman and all her passion was to present the best fruit of her life to the lord she prayed for a boy child now look at the context of india if you get married and uh, what is the first expectation when you have a child very sadly non biblical it is a boy or a girl that is our first thing and if it is a boy i have seen sweets are distributed in some places and if it is a girl there is no joy in that delivery time this is not biblical and we cannot quote hannah did that no hannah asked for a boy for what so that she can present that boy completely to god the intentions was right right so hannah was asking for a boy so that she can present the child to god in verse 11 she made a vow so that uh, god gives him a child he will be presented to god so she was a woman of presentation dear fathers dear mothers let me ask you what are you presenting to the lord the best thing that you can give to the lord is not your money not your talents not your material possessions the best presentation you can give back to the lord is a wonderful children that god has blessed you with do you want to give your children to the lord are you really interested in presenting your children to the lord that means you need to take steps to do that teaching them the word of god as much as you take interest in them for their secular studies for their a secular degrees and secular talents you should take equal and more importance in bringing your children up in the fear and in the admonition of the word of god present your children present your family in the presence of god we were having vbs and have seen that parents have gone a long way to bring their children to the vbs this time vbs was an amazing success we had packed children in this place and the power of god was powerful as we led them in god's word and god's power and i could see that some parents had taken leave to come and bring their children uh, to the vbs so that their children will be a part and they took time to present these children in the presence of god and we as parents should do everything that we can to take steps for godliness in our children and present our children in the presence of god amen so she was a woman of presentation and not only that she was a woman of 
purity. She was a pure woman. She lived pure as much as possible by her. In chapter 1 verse 13 to 16. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take yourself for a wicked uh, woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Talks about her state of mind. Anguish, grief, troubled. And she talked about herself a servant three times talking to Eli. Look at her humility as a mother. A servant. Look at the condition of her heart. She is in anguish. She is in trouble. But she is praying in all humility, calling herself as a servant. And she is telling about the purity of her life. Where? Right in the presence of God. Right to the high priest over there. It talks about the purity of Hannah's life. She was a woman of purity. A woman of virtue. She poured out her heart to the Lord, drank neither wine nor strong drink, and she refrained from the impurities of the world in her time. Dear mothers, dear fathers, if you and I need to rise up godly heritage for the Lord, we need to be holy, stay pure as much as possible. And only in godly families and holy families can God birth people like Samuel into our homes. Amen? She was a woman of purity. And then what happened? In verse 17 to 18, Eli answered, Go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Now this is faith. This is patience. She was a woman of great patience. The moment she went to the temple and she poured out our heart in the presence of God, she did not come out of her prayer the way she went in. How do we pray? We have a lot of challenges and we go through anguish and trouble. Most of us do not pray when we have deep troubles. I've spoken to a lot of Christians when you have little trouble, you pray. When you have little more trouble, you pray. And I've spoken to a lot of people in my one-on-one -on -one talk that when they are surrounded by problems, when they are in the deepest pit, they get even bitter with God and they stop their prayers. Hannah was not like that. In the, her deepest bitter experience, she prayed. And when she prayed, she did not get an immediate answer. But what did she do? She believed that a prayer has been answered. And she received the peace of God that surpasses the understanding that she is barren. She, her face was no longer downcast. She started behaving with faith and she went out with joy. How do we go to prayer and come out of our prayer closet? Do we go with the same countenance and again come back and, and our face is sad and we try to figure out our own way through the problems? That's not the true prayer of Hannah. Hannah went to the Lord and she gave her request to God and that's it. She knew that God has heard a prayer and she had the peace of God irrespective of her circumstances. She had the joy that could uh, surpass her situations and her face was never downcast and she was a woman of faith. She waited patiently. So what a beautiful heavenward relationship we can find in Mother Hannah. She was a woman of prayer. She was a woman of passion. She was a woman of presentation, giving her best to God. She was a woman of purity. And she was a woman of patience and faith that we find in the life of Hannah. So here is an amazing mother. A mother who shared a wonderful love relationship with her husband. And a mother who shared a good relationship with her heavenly father. And the third thing about Hannah is that uh, Hannah had a right home relationship, right? Come to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and it's verse 19 and 20. As a result of this, what happened? Early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord and they went back to their home at Ramah. 
Elkana made love to his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. God answered a prayer and she named him Samuel saying, because I asked the Lord for him. So now uh, they have received a child. God has answered their prayers. And now come to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Elkanah kept going back. Look at that godly father. Even after Hannah conceived and had a child, this man was a God-fearing man. He had his own imperfections. He did not wait for God and pray for his wife, but he went for a second wife. Which man is perfect? Which woman is perfect? Nobody is perfect. He was a God-fearing man with his own imperfections. Hannah was a God-fearing woman with her own imperfections. Nobody is perfect over here. But the beauty is that God is willing to work with imperfect people. And we should also be willing to accept some of the imperfections in our, in our spouse. We cannot expect my husband to be Mr. Perfect or my wife to be Miss Perfect. Because God works with imperfect people. And here he went back again to the temple. And this time Hannah did not go. Verse 22. Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord. And he will live there always. It may look that Hannah has backslided. It may look that for Hannah now, God is not important. That's not the way to read this passage. Hannah knew the right priority now. Listen to me very carefully. I have seen women neglecting her own children and going for ministry, which is not a biblical pattern. I have seen men neglect their own wives and children, have no time for the children, have no time for this wife. But ministry is number one priority. It doesn't come that way. Who said to you that? God first, family second, and ministry third. So at times we need to know how to prioritize our family over ministry. And that's the balance of a Christian pastor or an evangelist or a child of God. First is God and then your family. Ministry begins right at home. If you are a failure at home, if your children don't have you when they need you, and if your spouse don't have you when they need you, and you are in the so-called name of ministry away from home, it doesn't happen that way. You need to be a first a minister at home before you are a minister for the world at large. And this is Hannah. She knew that she needed to take a break from the worship team. She knew that she needed to take a break from some time of women's fellowship. Now, sister, give me a break. I've got a child. I need to take care of my child. I'll come back. I'll come back after the child has been weaned. And she was a wonderful woman. To, she knew how to prioritize. No family counseling. Remember, they are living in days of no family counseling. She used her wisdom. They are living in the days of no fertility clinics. No fertility clinics around in that place. But they were God-fearing people and God blessed them. This morning, I want you to understand that God is definitely important, but we need to prioritize at various times. We go to many houses for visiting and I've seen when we ask the wives, are you working? They feel so bad in telling that I'm not working, pastor. Before uh, the children were born, I was working and they feel so bad to tell that they're not working. Because the husband is working and to take care of the children, she has put down her papers. But I want to tell you, I want to stand up and salute that woman. Because she found priority in the family than her career. And she was willing to sacrifice her career for the sake of the family. You are not to be insulted because of that. You don't have to feel low about it. You have done an excellent job. And Hannah said the same thing. And it was not Hannah's decision alone. It's, look at that verse 22. Hannah did not go there. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. In verse 23, look at what her husband replied. It was a unanimous decision. Do what seems best to you. Her husband Elkanah told her, stop here until you have weaned him. Only 
may the lord make his good word so the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she weaned him look at the home relationship that she shared with her husband and everything that she did she did it in consultation with her husband because she shared love with this man she did not do anything independently and when god needed a godly woman in her generation god found hannah because he became a seer he became a prophet he became he became the instrument through whom through whom god spoke he was the prophet who anointed the first two kings of israel the transition between judges and the kings was done by this great man of god samuel and look at that they went back to the temple uh, gave the child back to uh, the temple uh, to eli to minister before the lord even after her prayers were answered she fulfilled the vows many of us are very quick in making vows but after the prayers are answered we conveniently forget the vows but she sacrificed only child she went and laid in the temple in chapter 1 verse 27 i prayed for this child and the lord has granted me what i asked him so i now give him to the lord for his whole life he will be given over to the lord and he worshiped the lord there this is a story of samuel's birth and how his mother was a godly mother in chapter 2 verse 11 then elkana went home to rama but the boy ministered before the lord under eli the priest first samuel chapter 2 verse 18 and 19 Samuel was ministering before the Lord and the boy wearing a linen ephod each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice so now listen to that mother's commitment again it's not that she got uh, uh, her son married in our terms or her daughter married and no more connection she is given over the son to the priest to Eli but she always cared for him i believe that when somebody went over to samuel's place to the temple where the ark of the covenant was the temple was not built by then it was in the tent that they met and she would send good homemade pickles to samuel he liked it she would send dress and every year she would go she was such a loving mother that she would go with a special dress to her samuel she was a loving mother even after samuel was given over to serve for the lord in chapter 2 verse 26 and the boy samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the lord and with people a godly mother a godly son a godly father result is a godly son and chapter 3 verse 1 the boy samuel ministered before the lord under eli in those days the word of the lord was rare and there were not many visions and you know in chapter 3 that the lord was speaking to samuel 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 how many times three times god started speaking to this godly child because he had godly parents and he continued in his godliness and eli said maybe god is speaking to you the third time so samuel went back to his place and he heard the fourth time god speak samuel samuel and he started hearing the voice of god do you want to hear your children like this where your children will hear the voice of god where your children will grow up and go out of your control and they will still continue to serve god it starts with a godly husband a godly mother a loving couple giving god the number one priority and giving priority to the family and god will bless your next generation can i hear an amen church amen we are talking about samuel but in the pages of first samuel chapter 1 2 and 3 and 4 there is mention of another family which is the other family other than the family of samuel eli's family now is a comparison for eli's family mother is not mentioned at all Hophni and Phineas mother is never in the picture according to the uh, scribes who have written this they're never in the picture yes they had a mother but no role no influence of the mother and what happened to this boys they became temple prostitutes they started sleeping with the women in the temple 
and the father became an ineffective father he could not discipline his children why there is no husband wife union we do not know what's happening there they are busy ministering in the presence of god they are busy ministering with the leaders of israel and talking and preaching but children are in wrong ways bad testimony disgrace to the name of god the role of the mother is not mentioned by the time you come to first samuel chapter 4 israel is in war with the philistines both eli's sons are captured and killed in the battle and eli hears that his sons are killed and he falls down from his seat breaks his neck and he dies his son's wife in chapter 4 and his verse 19 his daughter in law the wife of phineas was pregnant and near the time of delivery when she heard the news that the ark of the lord had been captured and that her father in law and her husband were dead she went into labor and gave birth but was overcome by her labor pains as she was dying the woman attending her said do not despair you have given birth to a son but she did not respond or pay any attention the boy ikabod saying the glory has departed from israel because of the capture of the ark of god and the deaths of her father in law and her husband she said the glory has departed from israel for the ark of god has been captured glory of god departed because of one wicked family but the glory of god came down to samuel because of a godly parent and a godly child which family do we want to be family of eli doing a lot of things for god having positions power money everything is there ministry yes i am involved in ministry but do you want to be a family of hannah far away from position and power but god fearing and god lifts up the humble to put to shame the wise and that's the god that we serve hannah and elkana they shared in a relationship with one another by mutual worship and mutual love they shared a relationship with heavenly father with prayer by presentation purity and patience and they shared priority in the family and they took decisions together and the result is samuel one of the greatest prophets we have seen in the book of the kings and samuels